This conversation is part of the James J. Blanchard Living Library of Michigan Political History, a project of the Michigan Political History Society. Hello, I'm Kyle Malin, editor of the MERS Newsletter, joined by Susan steiner Bullhouse. Today we're going to have a conversation with Bill Ballinger, former state legislator, state department director, racing commissioner, editor of two publications, including the Ballinger Report, a well-read political, uh, political newsletter online. Bill, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure, Kyle so and Susan. So I went through a lot of things that people uh, may recognize your name and attach you to, but what do you attach yourself to when you think of when, if you were to put your name on the tombstone, what would you want it to say? Terminal political junkie. Terminal political junkie. Explain that. Well, I mean, I started out um, in politics, if you want to call it that, back in the 1960s working for the Republican State Central Committee in the fall of 1965 when Ellie Peterson was the first female state party chairman for either major political party in the entire country. And two years later, I found myself in the Michigan legislature uh, in the state house at the age of 27 um, in 1968, served one two-year term and then one four-year term in the Senate, and we were off to the races. There's a lot more I can tell you about uh, what I did and how that happened in the 1960s. And I never would have thought growing up in Flint, Michigan, that I would have ended up in that place. Uh, I wanted to write. I wanted to be either an author uh, or you know, a novelist or short story writer or maybe a journalist. Uh, and strangely enough, I started out writing when I got out of college, and then I got into politics, and then, you know, some 20 years later, I end up where I really wanted to begin, journalism. And, but it was about politics again, Michigan politics. So, terminal political junkie, uh, it covers the waterfront. A lot of different uh, avenues to arrive at that particular destination. What was the one particular item that made you switch from wanting to be a writer to go into politics? I know that you were overseas in Ireland for a while where you did do writing, then you came back here. So what made you decide to go from journalism into politics? It was really odd. I had a strange choice in the fall of 1965. I had an interview interview set up with Time Magazine coming back from Ireland. Uh, I could have had that. I might have been hired, uh, would have gone into journalism, would not have been in politics in any way, shape, or form. But also, there were connections I had back in Michigan through my wife at the time, the former Virginia Lee Woodard, nicknamed Bunny, in Owasso. Uh, she had a very good friend who was on the Republican State Central Committee who was very close to Ellie Peterson, and she said, I've got this guy with a somewhat sketchy journalistic writing background coming over from Ireland. He might want to remain in Michigan rather than take some exotic job with a national magazine in New York. Uh, do you have anything for him down in Lansing? Well, she was looking for somebody in public relations, if you can believe it, and I had never been involved in the Republican Party in any way, shape, or form. And Ellie Peterson hired me on the spot as an assistant director of public relations. And after a year, she made me director of research at the Republican State Central Committee headquarters. In Lansing? In Lansing. And we were living on a farm, Bunny and I, between Ovid and Langsburg, and I would commute down for seven straight years. I commuted from the farm down to Lansing. Uh, the first three years uh, to the Republican State Party headquarters where Ellie Peterson presided. 
Uh, and then the next four years uh, as a member of the legislature, that's another story. But in any event, that's how I got into politics. It, it could have happened very easily. I never got into it. I only took one political science course in my entire college career, ever. I was an English major. Uh, I never thought about, you know, going into politics. I'd always had an interest in politics. I kind of followed it in the newspapers, but really in a very casual way, I thought. And so it's amazing that literally uh, five years, six years after I graduated from college, never having really done anything. I was not a political activist. I was not a member of any political organizations until I took a job with Ellie Peterson. I found myself the youngest Republican legislator in 1968. Did she ask you to run? Did somebody no. ask you to run? Did it come from yourself? No, you know, that, that is another thing. There was a very colorful character that many people in Michigan politics will remember, and he just died recently, Jerry Rowe, mm. who was the executive director, became the executive director for the Republican Party. He had been brought up by Ellie Peterson from Washington when she was a national vice chairman for the Republican Party. She discovered him down there. He said to me, when I started working at the Republican headquarters, he said, Ballinger, what are you doing at night when you go home? <laughs> uh, That's a loaded I was living question. Up yeah, right. In Shiawassee County, and he said, "You got ought to get uh, started. Uh, form a young Republican club up there." And so I did. And in the space of like four months, it was the third biggest young Republican club in the entire state. Next thing I knew, the county Republican Party which had been through a bloodbath in 1964 with Barry Goldwater as the party's nominee getting shellacked by Lyndon Johnson. Now remember, we're talking about early 1966 at this point. They were looking for a party chairman, a party chairman. They said, Ballinger, you did such a good job with young Republicans, we'll make you party chairman. So I became the youngest party chairman of the state. I was only 25 years old and I'd just come back uh, after a year in Ireland to uh, begin working for the Republican Party, and I found myself as a Republican chairman. That's really interesting. Now, in your in your background, your family background, yeah. um, was there anybody involved in politics there? You know, there actually was way back in the 19th century. Uh, if you go, dig into any family tree of anybody who's lived in this country very long, and you're going to find politicians somewhere. Uh, my family on both sides came to this country in the 18th century. I have antecedents who fought in the American Revolution, in Virginia and in Connecticut regiments. So I go back a long way. So I had a great-grandfather. He was the first William Sylvester Ballinger, born in 1833, and he was an elected uh, state representative in Indiana. Mm. And he was a small-town lawyer, and he died at the age of only 39. And then his son, my grandfather, uh, came to Flint in 1888 at the age of 22 as a bookkeeper for the Flint Wagon Works, which was a uh, buggy, horse and buggy manufacturer uh, before the so-called horseless carriage uh, had really uh, taken root. And um, he became the first treasurer of Buick and Chevrolet, and he became one of the original investors in General Motors with Billy Durant in 1906, 1908. Uh, he was not a politician, although he once was elected, I think, to the Flint School Board. He served on that for six years, but he wasn't a politician. Uh, so in recent vintage, uh, there was nobody in my family. My father again, served on the Flint School Board. He was elected to the Flint School Board, but my father is a politician? I don't think so. He was a banker. Uh, he was a trust officer, the farthest thing from a politician. Uh, so I don't know where my interest came other than just being an avid reader of newspapers and magazines when I was growing up, uh, when I was in my 40s and in the 1940s and 1950s. Um, but all of a sudden I decided, you know, this looks like fun. And I think I can actually use my writing ability uh, to my advantage in politics. And, you know, I wrote a weekly newspaper column every year, every week. 
I was in the legislature for six years. Um, so I drew on my journalism there. You mentioned Flint, that your grandfather, I believe, was the first Ballinger to come right. to Flint. Ballinger is, very, is a very prominent name in Flint. You were born in Flint. And take us from your birth, your schooling in Flint, through college, what it is you learned, what it is that you aspire to going through school. Well, it was very interesting. I grew up in a well-to-do neighborhood in the Southwest Flint. I was born before Pearl Harbor, March 28, 1941. Um, my next door neighbors were uh, the son and grandchildren of C.S. Mott of the Mott Foundation, very prominent Flint family, well known nationally. Um, there were, you know, wealthy people living all around me. The president of General Motors, Harlow Curtis, who was Time Magazine's Man of the Year in 1954, lived just two blocks away. And did a Summerfield? Uh, Arthur Summerfield uh, was, was the postmaster. postmaster general for Dwight mm -hmm. Eisenhower, uh, lived just a couple of streets away. And you know what? Everybody went to public school. Everybody. We walked up to a public school on Corona Road, half a mile away, every single day, in the same building for 10 straight years, kindergarten through ninth grade. Uh, totally different today in Flint. We won't go into that. Uh, but, no buses that will take uh, you, have, you know, no, well, for half a mile. What's gone on in the Flint public school system is not a pretty picture. So let's not go there. But Back in the day, we were all egalitarians. We all went to public school. And, uh, you know, then I went away to secondary school, a boarding school in New Jersey, Lawrenceville, uh, seven miles away from Princeton. My father was a Princeton graduate, class of 1929. So I always aspired to go to Princeton. I got in Princeton. I went to Princeton four years, graduated in 1962. So that was my life growing up in Flint. But I still have strong connections with uh, people I went to school with. Uh, there are even high school reunions for Flint Central High School, now closed. And Flint Tech closed since 1959. And I go to those reunions. And th they all look at each other and say, was Ballinger in our class? <laughs> and I wasn't. But the reason I go there is because my classmates at Zimmerman Junior High School went on to Flint Tech and Flint Central. So I go to their reunions. So uh, I still have a strong connection with Flint today, and I live there most of the time. So as far as your time in Princeton, do you still keep in touch with the folks that you went to Princeton with? And how influential was that in your life? I think it was very influential, yes. I mean, my closest friends at Princeton, I'm still in close touch with. None of them are in Michigan. There were very few people who went to Princeton or to the Ivy League from Michigan at that time. There's still not that many proportionately, but in those days it was really a sparse group. My best friends at Princeton were from Tennessee, uh, Baltimore, uh, you know, New Orleans, uh, a lot of Southerners at Princeton, more than any other Ivy League school. I was in a club that had a lot of uh, Southerners in it. Uh, so I'm very close friends with all those people, um, keep in touch with them over time. The English department at Princeton was staggeringly brilliant. Uh, we had uh, Carlos Baker, who was the biographer of Ernest Hemingway. We had Lawrence Thompson, who was a biographer of Melville and Robert Frost. Uh, these were people who not only lectured us, but Princeton all, always had and still has a system called the Precept System, Preceptorial, founded by Woodrow Wilson when he was president of Princeton in the early 20th century, in which uh, once a week, uh, small groups, literally six, eight, ten students, have an hour seminar with the greatest minds in in. English literature uh, in the academic world at that time. People like Baker and uh, Lawrence Thompson and Dudley Johnson and Willard Thorpe, these people were giants. So, I mean, I had a huge uh, positive experience as an English major. And you write a senior thesis at Princeton. I wrote it on H.L. Mencken, the legendary journalist uh, from the early 20th century. And so this was part of my reasoning about wanting to become a writer. 
and uh, that led to where I talked about in the beginning. You spoke about having been in Ireland and then how you got, got into the House, the State House, and right. then the State Senate. After serving one term each in both the House and the Senate, right. what made you decide to go beyond that for bigger and better? Well, first of all, when I was in the Senate at the end of my one term, four-year term there in 1974, uh, I ran for Congress to succeed Charles Chamberlain, who was a longtime uh, Republican member of Congress from mid-Michigan. Um, there was a, a primary, three candidates on the Republican side. On the Democratic side, uh, there was a candidate named Bob Carr, uh, M. Robert Carr. Mm -hmm. And by the way, he's my Facebook friend today, and we exchange notes all the time and everything else. I never got to face Bob Carr in the general election because in the primary, I got upset, and I think that's probably the best word for it, uh, by none other than Clifford Taylor, whose campaign was run by Spencer Abraham. And they were very conservative. I was a very moderate, Millican moderate Republican, astoundingly so. The things I voted for today have made modern Republicans' hair stand on end when they see it. Um, so I think it came back to haunt me in the primary and I finished uh, second out of three candidates. And so that was the end. I'd given up my Senate seat. So the Ford administration, and Jerry Ford by that time was president. Uh, Richard Nixon had just resigned in August of 1974. I lost the primary about that time. And later in the year, uh, the Ford administration uh, appointed me to go to the old Department of Health, Education, and Welfare in Washington. So we moved Kit and Caboodle all the way to Washington. Lived in Old Town, Alexandria for two years. Uh, I became Deputy Assistant Secretary of HEW while I was there in the Ford administration. I think I'm the last remaining person in Michigan alive who served in the Ford administration. Spencer Johnson, who used to be the head of the Michigan Health and Hospital Association, just died about two weeks ago. He was the last before me. So I'm the only one left. And uh, then, of course, in November of 1976, uh, Jerry Ford lost to Jimmy Carter. So then what? I had to leave. But anyway, that's how I got to Washington. You mentioned uh, that you were a moderate Republican back in the 70s, yeah. and we're filming in 2019. There's hardly any moderate Republicans <laughs> left. Uh, tell, take us back to that time and, yeah. and what being a moderate Republican meant and, and kind of the evaporation and the extinction of that brand of Republican. I gotta tell you, Kyle, moderate Republicans today are chicken feed compared to the kind of moderates we were back in the day. In fact, there were people called liberal Republicans, like John V. Lindsay, the mayor of New York, former congressman. Uh, there were U.S. senators like Jacob Javits of New York, Tom Keekle in California, U.S. senator, Clifford Case in New Jersey. Um, Nelson Rockefeller was viewed as, you know, a liberal Republican, okay? So, I mean, when I was in the Michigan legislature, now, now get this, uh, kind of you know, fasten your seatbelt. I mean, I was pro-choice on abortion, okay? I voted for a huge hike in the state income tax from 2.6 to 3.9%, okay? Uh, that's the level that everybody talks about going back to now as a nice sane level, 3.9. Heck, we hiked it, you know, from 2.6, which was the original level. I w uh, voted for, you know, no-fault uh, auto insurance, no-fault divorce. I got a perfect voting record, 100% from an environmental group. I don't know whether it was the Michigan Environmental Council, whether it was Sierra Club, whatever. I was one of like three Republicans that had a perfect record. No Democrat had a better record than I did. I was the sponsor, the prime sponsor in the Senate of the Equal Rights Amendment. My name is on the Equal Rights Amendment. At the time we passed it, we were one of the first states to do it. And of course, it came within an ace of being approved. 
So it was just different back then that, I mean, today you equate party with ideology. Right. You're a Republican, you're a conservative, yeah. you're a Democrat, you're a liberal. Was there more mingling back in the 70s than there is now? You know, mingling in ideologically? Yeah. Uh, there was more mingling. Uh, yeah. I mean, you do these roll call analysis. I know MERS does this in which you evaluate voting records, you know, who's well, the you most liberal. Well, you that the yeah, Inside and Michigan I did politics. Inside Michigan politics. And I'm saying today the gulf is cavernous between the two sides. I mean, there's hardly any meeting in the middle. I, I'm just saying uh, at the time you could be more moderate or liberal as a Republican and still be considered a Republican. I, the Democrats had no illusions about me being, you know, a, a Republican. They thought... They didn't think, oh, we could recruit this guy, Ballinger. He's going to, you know, maybe switch parties or he's going to join us or, you know, we can always count on him for what. No, they couldn't. Um, I had Democrats say to me, you know, you're the worst kind of Republican because you don't vote like, you know, the extreme right wing Republicans do. And yet you're very partisan. Uh, and so, you know. <laughs> So it was a totally different situation, a totally different ballgame. There were a couple of other legislators, Gil Bursley, a state senator from Ann Arbor. Can you believe the entire Washtenaw legislative delegation was Republican? No. Well, uh, they were all Republicans. And, and uh, Carl Purcell, who was from Plymouth, later became a congressman. He was pretty liberal. So we were moderate to liberal, uh, much more uh, liberal than so-called moderates today. Uh, these guys and gals today who call themselves moderates or are called moderates, they look like right-wingers to me. You have covered <laughs> your races for the, for the Michigan House and the Senate and Congress. There was one other race that you undertook and that you put a lot of shoe leather into. Whoa, yeah, I know. We're leaping ahead here, and yep. this is 1982. And, um, I want to get all of the races taken care of. Okay, all the races. Care of. Well, that, that really was a, a race to remember because I did a walk through Michigan. I decided as a strategy, and Jerry Rowe was one of the uh, inspirations for this. He said, you know, this would be a great idea. So I started out in uh, mid to late January of 1982. Now, let me set the stage here. Uh, Don Regal was the U.S. Senator, and he was completing his first six-year term. He was running for re-election. And there were four Republicans running for the nomination for the right to oppose him. Me and a former congressman from the Upper Peninsula named Phil Rupi, and Bob Huber, a former state senator, a former mayor of Troy, and Dean Baker, who was a regent of the University of Michigan. We were the four. And I decided I'm going to walk through Michigan, walk through Michigan, uh, the length of Michigan, and well, it turned out the breadth of Michigan as well, and I can explain why. But um, this was not a, a freakish uh, stratagem. Uh, Lamar Alexander in Tennessee, who is a U.S. Senator today, a former governor of Tennessee, he did this in Tennessee. He walked through Tennessee. Lawton Childs, a Democrat in Florida, called Walkin' Lawton. Uh, he walked through Florida and became governor of Florida. Uh, this was done in some other states. So what I did was I started out in mid to late January uh, 1982. I will never forget it. It was one of the coldest winters on record. It was 19 below zero at the International Bridge in the Sioux when I started my walk. And Jerry Rowe went up with me. And you started I, in the Upper Peninsula? I started in Sioux St. Marie. Why did you do that? Because uh, you want to come downstate, uh, wend your way downstate, and get down to where all the action is and the population is as you get nearer the primary in August, okay? Uh. And so uh, I decided, well, maybe starting in Iron Mountain is a little too far away. <laughs> maybe Marquette is even a little too far away. I think I'll just kind of cheat a little bit and get over here on the east edge. I'll start in Sault Ste. Marie. Do you realize I covered uh, in two days the walk from 
uh, Sault Ste. Marie down to the Mackinac Bridge. You had to keep warm. That's probably why. Uh, you know what? I had frostbite on my face at the end of that day. I mean, it was really bad. When I got to the Mackinac Bridge, we were staying with Walt and Sally North. Walt was the executive director of the Mackinac Bridge Authority at the time. He was later a state senator. And they had a beautiful home overlooking the straits from the Upper Peninsula. And Walt reminded me, he said, you know, Bill, you're not going to be able to walk across the Mackinac Bridge. Nobody walks across the Mackinac Bridge except on one day of the year. And you know when it is, the Labor Day walk. Well, obviously this wasn't Labor Day. But he said, I got an idea. Why don't you walk over to Mackinac Island on the ice bridge? Because you've got to remember, this was one of the most frigid winters in Michigan history. I mean, it was 19 below zero at the Sioux, and it was still 19 below zero when I got to the Mackinac Bridge. So there was a, an ice bridge. The entire straits was absolutely uh, like yards deep in an ice cap. And so my motor bus driver and I set out from the southern shore of the Upper Peninsula and we walked toward Mackinac Island. Now, we could have been blown off course uh, by a blizzard uh, to Marquette Island or uh, Le Cheneau, um, but the Upers had made a trail of tiny Christmas trees all the way from the UP to the island, and we followed that. I'll never forget, it was a cloudy, a windy day, very gloomy. We were all alone, had no guide, but we did have the trees. And what we did was the ice was very clear on top. There wasn't snow. It had blown off to a great extent. And we made like seals. And we literally were barking, and we would uh, try to run. Uh, it was slippery, but we would belly flop and we would coast 30 to 40 feet. I mean, it was like unbelievable. Uh, and, and we just had fun. And I remember lying on my tummy, peering down into the dark ice uh, and seeing cracks and fissures as far as the eye could see, kind of like Jules Verne, 20,000 leagues beneath the sea. And uh, there was no chance the ice was going to break. I mean, it was rock thick. So it took us about an hour and a half, as I remember, to get to the island. It was about three to four miles. We got there, and the entire island was socked in. I mean, it was blanketed with snow, and it was deadly calm, a ghostly silence over everything, no sign of human habitation. But we knew that there was a meeting of the village council down in the Mackinac Island town. So we made our way there, uh, shouldering and struggling our way through the drifts. And we got there, and these were the only people we ever saw on the island, the village council, and they looked at me with bemusement uh, and some laughter as I reported to them how I happened to be there and why I was there. And uh, a sheriff's deputy, Mackinac County Sheriff's deputy was there, and he said, you know what, if you want a ride on my snowmobile, I'll take you to the mainland, the Lower Peninsula, if you want to. Well, we took him up on it, and that was a thrill. That was a lot of fun, but we got worrying, you know what, maybe this violates the integrity of our walk because the whole idea was this was going to be an unbroken walk from the International Bridge at the Sioux all the way to the Detroit River, uh, even though it was interrupted in time by my having to leave periodically and go downstate, we always came back to exactly the spot we had left and picked up. Uh, but we remembered, okay, we've already walked from the UP to the island. It's about three or four miles, about as long, maybe a little longer than the Mackinac Bridge. So, in effect, we have covered it. Uh, we got it covered even if we get a little freebie ride here to the Lower Peninsula to Mackinac City, which is what we did. 
And uh, then I must say, we never faced a challenge like that again uh, in the over 1,000 miles southward that I went over the next half year. What I would do is I'd walk for about four days. Uh, I had a trailer follow me. I'd stay in it overnight. I had a driver. And uh, I'd get up the next day. I'd pick up where I left off walking. I'd walk for another seven, eight miles. I'm, I know the farthest walk I ever had in a single day was 20 miles, and it was in northern Kent County. I remember that. But in any event, um, I it would leave and go downstate. I would do fundraising. Uh, I would give speeches, I, you know, whatever, do the usual stuff that candidates do. And then I'd turn around and I'd go back up to my, you know, trailer, get in it, start where I left off, and keep going. The problem, Kyle, was by March, I had reached Genesee County. And this thing was supposed to end in August. And we're literally five months away and I'm almost there in just two months. I'd come all the way down state. So what did I do? I said, okay, I'm going to go across state. I'm just going to stop right here, and I'm going to go through Owasso, St. John's, Ionia, Grand Rapids, uh, Muskegon. I'm going to go down the coast. I'm going to go to Berrien County. I'm going to come up through Cassopolis. I'm going to go to Kalamazoo, Battle Creek, Jackson, I did all these things. I came all the way up to Oakland County, Pontiac, picked up Woodward Avenue, walked down Woodward Avenue from the middle of Oakland County all the way to the Detroit River. Wow. And when I got to the Detroit River, I'll never forget, we had a rally plan at, you know, Grand Circus Park or something in uh, Detroit, and everybody marched down the uh, Woodward Avenue to the river where I was going to jump in the river. And I had news media trailing me, TV cameras, newspapers. And I had people coming up and saying, don't jump in the river. Don't. There's an undertow. You're going, to be sucked in. You're going to be sucked into the river if you do that. I decided, well, I'm sucked in the river. I'm sucked in the river. I promise I'm going to dive in the river, and that's what I'm going to do. I had to do it. If that was the last you saw of me, I'm going down fighting. So I got there, we got to the banks, and I, boop, I went in the river. It was cool. I just bobbed to the surface like a cork, and I clambered up. There was a ladder. We made sure there was a ladder in the seawall, and I got up. And a TV camera came rushing up to me and said, uh, Mr. Ballinger, we missed that. Would you do it again for us? So I, <laughs> I did. I jumped in again, and I clambered back up. So this was like in early August. And by that time, I had, I had walked over 1,100 miles. How many shoes did you go through? <laughs> uh, one pair. And I still got them today. They're Herman survivors. They're indestructible. I got great advice uh, from a conservationist and a hiker starting out said, get Herman survivors. They'll never wear out. And they keep you warm in the winter and cool in the summer. And they are great, and I still got them. Your Senate race came after your time in Washington with President Ford. Right. The 60s were a really strange decade here yes. in the States. Yeah. You first of all had Nixon with Agnew. Agnew resigned. Then Ford was appointed vice president. Then Nixon resigns. What was your connection to Ford before he became vice president, and how were you able to be one of the first appointees. If I recall correctly, you were appointed within the first week of Ford's administration. You were one of the first to be appointed within the first week of his administration. I don't know whether it was one of the first. From Michigan, maybe. Yes. 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 Yeah, you're probably right. No, that's a very good question. I actually, I had very little personal interaction with Gerald Ford. Uh, the one thing we had in common was our districts actually overlapped. My state senate district overlapped with the eastern part of his old congressional district before he became vice president. What did your district I own like? County. Well, uh, mine was a huge district. Uh, it was kind of like an extended version of what is the 24th senate district today. I'll tell you what it was. It was Shiawassee County, Clinton County, Gratiot County, almost all of Montcalm County, almost all of Eaton County, and the northeastern corner of Ingham County. 
I mean, it was bigger than many states, and it had, you know, 350,000 people in it, roughly. It had uh, small towns that were of fairly uh, modest size, like Owasso, St. John's, Alma, uh, Greenville, Charlotte, uh, Grand Ledge, uh, Williamston, the, those were the biggest towns. It excuse, was mainly farmland. Excuse me, wasn't this the time when you also shared office space with John Engler? It was. Uh, okay. That's, that's, that, that's something another story. else. That's, that's another story. That's I'm sorry. Another Let's story. get back on track. Yeah, I'm sorry. John Engler and I did something that <clears throat> nobody else really has ever done. Uh, when I see allusions to it, it's, they're always doing it kind of at taxpayer expense, it seems to me. We did it out of our own pocket. And that is we opened a uh, joint office in Greenville, which we shared. Uh, in calendar year 1971. He had just been elected to the House. He was one of the youngest elected state representatives in the history of Michigan. I was only 29. We used to bill ourselves as the youngest pair of legislators in the entire country. He was 21 and I was 29, so our average age was 25 between the two of us. And we would go in, we would alternate uh, weeks, and we'd go up on a Friday, and we'd sit in that office for four hours, yeah, so citizens could come in and talk to us and ask questions. Now, John Engler later said, I felt like the Maytag repairman, <laughs> uh, because he said, hardly anybody ever came. And this despite the fact that there was all this belly aching and whining and moaning from people in Montcalm County, that they had nobody from Montcalm County in the legislature. Well, not living there, they didn't. They were represented, but they hadn't had anybody in like, I don't know, 20 years. So they felt left out. So we said, okay, we'll open an office and you can all come and talk to us. And then they never really came. Uh, but back to the story about Gerald Ford. Gerald Ford's district was mainly Kent County, but it slopped over into like part of Montcalm and, and that was my territory. And part of Clinton, I think he even had a little bit of Clinton, believe it or not. Um, so the real uh, connection uh, for me was Charles Chamberlain, Chuck Chamberlain, who was a former uh, Ingham County prosecuting attorney and then a longtime congressman. He was on the cover of Time magazine, I'll never forget, back in the day, 56, that was it. He was on the cover of Time magazine uh, because he was in a very tight marginal district race in Michigan at that time, which he won. And, and uh, he was a really great guy, and we had a very close relationship. I was a county chairman in Shiawassee, which was part of his district. And so he said, Bill, I will uh, get you a job in HEW, and he did. And Ford appointed me. Ford and I didn't really know each other that well. So when you were in the legislature, I want to ask, what memory is more clear? Your first bill? that you put in or your first public act? Wow, uh, I would say the first public act uh, because the bills I put in uh, in the House were really pretty minor stuff. Uh, I can barely even remember them. They involved uh, things like fishing stuff. I was on the Conservation and Recreation Committee. Um, I, I don't think I got anything passed and signed into law as a representative. I only served one two-year term. And then in 1970, there was an open state Senate seat, and I won that, and I got in the Senate. Now, once I got in the Senate, then I got legislation passed. And I'll, probably my biggest bill <laughs> was called the Weir's Bicky Ballinger Pesticide Control Act. <laughs> oh highly, highly venerated by the Michigan Farm Bureau. And I, I got the uh, Farm Bureau's uh, you know, Agriculture uh, Legislator of the Year Award when I was in the legislature. I was chairman in the Senate of the Agriculture and Consumer Affairs Committee. I later, later became chairman of Health and Social Services. Um, and I, I sponsored all the bills that added public members to licensing boards. And ironically, I became later the director of the State Department of Licensing and Regulations, which had 38 different licensing boards within it. It's kind of like LARA is today, Licensing and Regulatory Affairs, an early version. And I was the one who sponsored all the public member 
legislation on all of these boards. So there was a lot of stuff I did in the Senate that got signed into law uh, that I remember. But in the House, uh, my record, voting record, I'll you know defend. But accomplishment in terms of public acts, no way, no. You just re referenced licensing and regulation. Right. Would you like to, to cover that era, which also very strongly includes Governor Milliken? Right. Well, it was really interesting. After President Ford lost in 1976, I went to Harvard to get a master's degree in public administration. So I was up at Harvard getting this master's degree in public administration, and it's March of uh, 1977. And I get a call from uh, Joyce Braithwaite, the famous dragon lady, uh, who was Governor Milliken's right-hand hatchet woman and managed his campaign in 1978, saying the governor wants you to come back and uh, become director of the State Department of Licensing and Regulation. Well, here I am uh, in the middle of this master's degree program at Harvard, and I mean, I'm three months away from the end of the academic year. And I said, okay, I'll take it. And, <laughs> and so I came back to Michigan, but then I kept flying out to Boston every weekend. And I actually managed to finesse it. I, I'm confessing this for the first time, nobody really knows it. Uh, I managed to pull it off. I'd go out to Harvard. I was like Brian Kelly, lieutenant yeah. governor. I did the same thing way before Brian Kelly. I would go out there for five or six days, go to all these classes, write papers, and I'd race back to Michigan and I'd spend a week uh, as director of the State Department of Licensing, and then I'd race off, and I did this for three months. Wow. And, and so then in June, I was free. Uh, from Harvard, I got my master's in public administration. I could be a full-time director of licensing and regulation, and I served in that capacity for four and a half years. And at the time I left, I was the longest-serving uh, director, I believe, uh, in, in the history of the department up to that time. Wow. Uh, so before, and, and this probably dovetails into when you were a director, but when you were a legislator, what was kind of your philosophy in uh, representing constituents. Were you more of the uh, type who, who thought that you should represent the views of your constituents, or did you feel like you should do what you felt was in the best interest of your constituents, which sometimes is not the same thing? You're absolutely right. That's a very good question. Uh, it's always a balancing act, and I think it is for every legislator. There's no question about it. Some legislators uh, take the tack that you just described. They consider themselves trustees on behalf of the people who elected them said, okay, they put us in office to exercise our best judgment. We're going to do that. We're not going to go back and take their pulse every weekend and say, well, how do you feel about this issue? How do you feel about that issue? But that's very important, uh, taking the pulse, because if you lose contact with your constituents, uh, if you get the feeling that, you know what, uh, these people had enough confidence to elect me, uh, I'm going to exercise my judgment and uh, devil take the hindmost in terms of uh, the reaction to it or anything else. Uh, if you have that attitude, you can get yourself in real electoral trouble. Now, I will say this. I never ran for re-election, you'll notice, I, you know, ever. I was moving to another office to run for, so there was never a real true test where people could say, you know, Ballinger, we sent you you know, down to Washington or to Lansing to do something, and uh, it doesn't look to us like you're doing that. Uh, you're, you're voting differently, and you're out of here, you know? So I never really had a true test, but I had a reputation and a voting record that had been built up over time, as I described earlier. Uh, and, you know, no matter whether I was running for re-election or for a new office, that record was part of my persona that was perceived by the voters. When Governor Milliken called you back from Harvard or, right. or had you jump back yeah. and forth, what had your relationship been with the governor or with Mr. Milliken, which he might have been before that, earlier, and what did it continue to be? Well, I always had um, a good relationship with Governor Milliken, and my wife, Bunny, uh, became very good friends with Helen Milliken. 
And Helen Milliken was more liberal than Governor Milliken. Uh, particularly on women's rights and abortion. Uh, and I th many people suspect that, frankly, she was an influence on him as time went on to the point where, you know, he was endorsing Democrats, you know, in the 21st century that probably never would have happened earlier, although uh, the party did definitely drift dramatically to the right during his lifetime. But Bunny was close to Helen Milliken, I had a very good relationship with Governor Milliken, but we weren't pals. I mean, he was an older man. Um, he was governor. I met him very early. I still remember him coming in with his aide, Don Gordon, to the Republican state headquarters when I was a, a puny little 25 or 26-year-old staffer for Ellie Peterson. I still remember meeting him when he was completely overlooked. Uh, submerged in the giant shadow of George Romney uh, between 64 and 68. Those were the four years that Milliken and Romney served together as uh, governor and lieutenant governor. Uh, and then I would say this, I think more than whether I had a personal relationship with Governor Milliken, uh, ideologically, we were pretty much on the same page on about everything. I mean, if anything, I was probably more liberal than he was, if you can believe that. I, everybody nowadays thinks of... As a conservative uh, Republican. Uh, well, <laughs> they, well, no, I mean, they think nowadays Milliken is being almost a communist if you're a Republican. And I'm saying he was looking, you know, conservative and right-wing compared to me on a lot of issues. He really was. What was your last appointed position before you went into publication of Inside Michigan well, Politics? Well, after uh, we get through licensing and regulation, so I quit that to run for the U.S. Senate to start walking through Michigan, and we've covered that. So when the race is over, now what happened in the race? In the primary, Rupi won the primary. He was a former congressman. Uh, he had a lot of... Uh, build up support and sympathy for him because four years before he'd wanted to run and he kind of got stabbed in the back. And so he won. I was second. Huber was third and Baker was fourth. But, you know, uh, close doesn't count. You got to win the nomination. So Rupi had the honor of challenging uh, or being the Republican nominee against Don Regal in November. And uh, he got smoked. Uh, it was a terrible year for the Republicans. The Republicans lost everything in 1982. Um, and so I probably was just as well that I lost the primary, although I argue that I probably would have run a more interesting race against Regal. I might have gone off on another walk. I don't know what I would have done, but I would have caused some excitement. Let's put it that way. Maybe you would have started in Ironwood this time since I it was have, August. I could have done that. I could have, you know, I missed part of the state. I'm going to go back and cover it. But anyway, the point was after that, what? It literally about a month went by, and Governor Milliken appointed me state racing commissioner, horse racing commissioner. Now, honestly, today people say, what? Was there such a thing? Uh, there was such a thing, and at one time it was a very uh, coveted post. Uh, Michigan was the third state in the country in 1933 to legalize paramutual horse racing. Uh, at one time, remember, the only way you could gamble in Michigan legally was horse racing. There was no lottery. There were no casinos. There wasn't any other way that you could legally gamble other than at the racetrack. Did you have a background in racing? I mean, why did Milliken none. pick you for that? None. Absolutely did, none. Had you ever bet on ponies before? Or? No, none. I, I came from a family where my mother and two sisters liked dressage, uh, you know, show jumping on horses. They had horses, but they weren't race trackers. They weren't touts. They weren't rail birds. But again, I always had followed horse racing. Uh, I'd always... You know, Milliken didn't ask me, do you know anything about horse racing? He never said anything. I think he thought, you know, Ballinger didn't really screw up too badly when he was director of licensing and regulation. I might trust him with another appointment, even if he doesn't know anything about the subject. And he does know the legislature, and, you know, he knows state government, so you know, I'll put him in there and let's see how he does. Well, I loved it. In fact, I almost think of all the jobs in politics I ever had in 
including the legislature, including in Washington. State racing commissioner was my favorite job. And let me tell you, when you were state racing commissioner, Michigan is the only state in the country with a single commissioner. And it's a full-time salary position. You're a czar. And in fact, I call myself today the czar. When I, call, when I talk to these people that I dealt with 40 years ago in racing, uh, I, I sign off as a czar, and they say czar. They, they refer to me as czar. That's what they call me. They don't call me commissioner, senator, director, anything else. They call me czar. And Michigan was the only state that had that. The rest of the states all had multi-member commissioners that were part-time, boring stuff. They'd point an executive director. In Michigan, you were everything. And I did a lot of promotion for horse racing, and I actually you know, improve the situation marginally, but let's face it, horse racing was already dying in Michigan because the lottery had already been in place for a dozen years and the casinos started to kick off about that time. Uh, you had the Indian casinos and then in 1996, uh, you got the three Detroit casinos on the ballot and they passed. And ever since then, it was down, down, down. And finally, you get to the 21st century, and Jennifer Granholm issued an executive order in which she really deep-sixed uh, the Office of Racing Commissioner and folded it into the state gaming board, uh, and, which I think is a, an abomination. And I think it could be challenged in court. But the point is, even if you resurrected a racing commissioner, what would he be able to do today? Hardly anything. We're down to like one track. It's like Northville. That's it, right? Yeah, I, I had seven tracks. Seven tracks. I I licensed three new tracks while I was commissioner. I came in with four. I licensed three more, and they're all gone except one, Northville. That's it. Your transition between racing commissioner and giving up your crown as czar, right? To later take that up. That was painful. I'm sure it was. <laughs> to then later take up your pen and typewriter and later computer to ultimately regain the title of Crown Prince of Pundits yeah. by the late Charlie Kane. Yeah. How did that transition go from horse racing yeah, that's... back to writing and doing it the old-fashioned way, mailing it? Yeah, no, that, that is a really good question. And actually, there's a connection. What I started, as soon as I was done being racing commissioner, I went to the sports editor of the Free Press, and I said, you know what, I want to start writing a racing column for you every week. So for six years, Kyle, I wrote a horse racing column. I've got it all. I, I, I can once a week? It. Once a week, I wrote a horse racing column about Michigan horse racing, what was going on at the tracks, harness racing, you know, thoroughbred racing, the whole shooting match. And I did this for six years, but it was, you know, it was a part-time thing. I'm writing one column a week. You know how much you write today uh, is so much, uh, so voluminous compared to the piddly little effort I was making. But all during that time, I was thinking, how can I capitalize on an idea that I've had for a long time? And that is start some kind of a subscription, uh, very short, brief, newsletter, political newsletter, uh, like existed in some other states. There's one in Tennessee, which I still think not only was the best then, it's still the best, called the Tennessee Journal. And you may know what it is. You may know the editor, Brad Forrester, has been the guy who's been the head of it. Um, and I decided, okay, I'm going to start um, a weekly new, uh, bi-weekly newsletter. I decided I'm going to make it once every two weeks. I started in March of 1987. So I was still writing a racing column, and I wrote it, I think, until like 19, yeah, I'm, I'm saying maybe 91. And then I stopped it, and I went full-time with Inside Michigan Politics. That was the name of the newsletter. And I started out very modestly, um, charging $125 a year, and just tried to build the uh, circulation up and as a, a paid subscription newsletter. So that was, that was the transition. So what was your idea behind Inside Michigan Politics? What did you hope to share yeah. with people? And, and what was kind of the universe of people you were yeah. trying to sell the newsletter well, to? Remember, at the time, you had Gongwer and you had MERS, Michigan Information Research Service. 
Uh, Gong War was going pretty strong. Both of those had been founded during the Constitutional Con uh, Convention. Uh, Gong War had already existed previously in Ohio, and uh, MERS was started up by uh, a local lobbyist who was a pretty strong uh, figure in Lansing at one time. But it had kind of fallen on hard times and wasn't doing very well by uh, the late 80s. And uh, until the Roarings and Steve Linder bought it in the mid-90s, it was floundering. And then they've turned it around, and now you're here, and things are really firing on all cylinders. That's another story. But my point was, I always felt when I was in the legislature and when I was in state government that the Capitol Press Corps that covered the legislature didn't understand what the hell was going on back at the grassroots at the local level in the various districts. They didn't know. And people at the local level uh, who could cover their local state senator or representative, they didn't totally understand everything that was happening in Lansing other than what they'd read in a wire service or something like that. And I thought, you know what? I can bridge the gap. I can uh, come up with something that's going to make people think a little more about the absolutely inextricably bound together connection between what's going on in Lansing and what's going on at the grassroots in the various districts. Also, picking up on what Susan just mentioned about horse racing, I'm going to start picking winners. I'm going to handicap. Like, you know, you go to the racetrack and some guy comes up to you with his car and says, hey, buddy, you know, here's the... Who's going to win the seventh race? I got it right here. You know, that kind of stuff. So start picking races and actually start picking judicial races, not just legislative races or whatever, but judicial races. Never been done before. So I started doing it, and I made fearless calls, many of them <laughs> dead wrong, but so what? I was doing it, and I was actually getting them right a pretty high percentage of the time. So I figured, you know, people would like something like that. I'm not going to try and be MERS or Gongwar and do a daily compilation of bills and bill analysis and what's being reported. I'm not, going to, I'm not going there. This is going to be a simple little four-page newsletter put out every two weeks, but it's going to have all sorts of spicy stuff in it. I had quotes. I did a lob I started doing the lobbyist survey where I, uh, I actually did a poll survey where I sent out questionnaires all over state government and got people to say, who's the greatest lobbyist, who's terrible? And, and they would put quotes, and I would print the quotes in the newsletter. And some of them were scabrous, and they were terrible. And people that. were furious, uh, and some of the stuff was in there. It had never been done before. But a lot of people said, hey, you know what? These lobbyists are making a hell of a lot of money. And who the hell is holding their feet to the fire? You know, isn't it right that public can comment on this? So I did that. So I did a lot of kind of breakthrough, first ever things in the newsletter. And my idea was just to see if I can get enough people. And you say, who was my audience? It was like everybody. Uh, well, I mean, it was anybody who had any interest in state government or in Michigan politics. Obviously, that could be legislators. It won, it's for several years, I had the entire Senate Democratic Caucus subscribe to my newsletter. I had a lot of legislators, a lot of lobbyists. I had trade association executives, uh, unions. Uh, I had uh, PACs, political action committees. You must have had a huge staff. Uh, me. That was it. And I never had bylines, never had bylines. Um, what I and I wrote it all myself, or sometimes I had people write stuff for me, or people would volunteer to write stuff for me, and very often they would want to give me stuff to write, which they were too gutless to publish <laughs> over their own byline, or they didn't want anybody to know who it was, and so I would rewrite it and I'd package it. So I mean, the whole idea was for people to look at the newsletter, and it was a seamless you know, kind of series of stories with no byline, and you just had to either accept or reject what was in front of you. And it wasn't attributable to anybody. Uh, and in fact, at one time, I, I took to interviewing myself. 
uh, people used oh, to. Oh yes, I yeah. People this. used to say, "Well, this is ridiculous. Uh, you're, you're interviewing yourself." I said, "Who can ask me better questions than me?" And so I'm going to interview myself, and I'd put that in there. So anyway, it worked, and so it was very successful. So what I'm really interested in here, Bill, is that after you had already been in politics for so many years, and you had already been kind of uh, labeled as a moderate Republican, and then you get into journalism, one of the dangers that happens when you jump fields like that is that you're already labeled as something. In right. this case, people already knew you as a Republican. So how hard was it to get inside Michigan politics out there and be seen as a straight shooter, somebody who yeah. was nonpartisan, when you had been a partisan for so many years? That was a major challenge from the very beginning. And it always, I'm not going to say haunted me, but it always was hovering over me as a major uh, hurdle that I had to surmount um, because I wanted to be seen as objective and nonpartisan, even though I had this very partisan past. But remember, I said that I made a lot of my reputation uh, writing the newsletter as a handicapper, picking races. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you can't be a partisan and be a handicapper with any objectivity and success, it seems to me, simultaneously, people are going to get very suspicious. They're going to say, are you kidding me? Ballinger, the Republican, is picking races. Uh, he's going to, you know, skew things the Republicans' way every time. So, I mean, I picked a lot of races uh, where, you know, I'd pick a Democrat to beat a Republican. Uh, and I think I build up a reputation, Susan knows this, over time, where a lot of people would come up to me and uh, or they'd come up to Susan or they'd come up to other people and they'd say, what are you really? I mean, what, what, <laughs> what do you really believe? I mean, right. what's your background? I mean, you've got to remember, a lot of people didn't have the great history in politics or government that I did and other people did, and they didn't know. They just knew the stuff I was putting out. And, and I, that, of course, made me burst my buttons with pride like I... By God, I've done it. You know, I've, they're convinced that I'm objective and I'm nonpartisan. So, yeah, it was always a challenge. I think the fact that I was, as you have observed, a so-called Millican moderate or a liberal Republican or whatever you want to say, made it easier for me to be accepted by Democrats and independents as being pretty much down the middle. Uh, I wasn't some flame-throwing right-winger, uh, either in the past or when I was doing the newsletter. And they could see that. It was pretty obvious. You seem to enjoy writing inside Michigan politics. You, I believe, enjoyed interviewing yourself. You enjoyed <laughs> recreating yourself. Um, in 2013, you decided to sell it. What prompted you after all those years to sell it? Was it partly because things were all going online and this was hard copy and the transition might have been difficult? Were you already thinking in 2013 that ultimately you wanted to pursue something which ended up being the Ballinger Report? I think it was everything you just said. I think the pace of technological change was becoming more and more alarming. Uh, I, you know, I, I fought and resisted putting any part of inside Michigan politics online for years. I had people pleading with me, saying, you can't have this primitive blue paper, four-page uh, newsletter hard copy forever. I mean, get with it. I mean, uh, you know, we're in the late, you know, 1990s, and I still wasn't doing it. Um, and so finally I decided, okay, I'm going to offer it online as well as hard copy. And so by the time 2013 came around when I decided to sell it, um, I gave people a choice. You can get it hard copy, you can get it online, or you can get both. And I was offering at, you know, the same price or whatever. Now there are various different ways you can market that and how you price it and so forth. I won't go into the details. But... I could see that the way things were going, and I'm, remember, I'm a solo person uh, doing this. And I had no help. I had no staff. I mean, I could have hired somebody, but why would I do that? I wanted to keep all the money and revenue myself. So uh, I just decided I've gotten to a point where it's too hard to do this 
uh, indefinitely. I mean, I've done it for 27 years. There were times during that 27 year period when I thought, you know, do I want to really keep doing this? And I mean, honestly, I had thoughts, you know, even back when it was going really well after maybe 10 or 15 years when I thought maybe I, you know, want to get out or want to do something else or I want to change this in some major way, but I always resisted until finally in 2013, I decided, okay, that's enough. And there are other things I want to do and do it in a different way, and I can still continue to maybe write. And frankly, I haven't even gotten to first base, as far as I'm concerned, with the Ballinger Report. I could make so much more of that. I'm doing a terrible job. Uh, but I'm lurching ahead, and I'm still trying to improve it, and I swear I'm going to get it to the point where I, it's what I want it to be. Well, not only has the Ballinger Report gotten you know, some traction, but also since selling the newsletter, since selling Inside Michigan Politics, you have also started a weekly podcast. Yep. And within the last two years, you now have a singleton, if you will, radio program, The Political Insider. What a perfect name for somebody who does know the inside of politics. Yeah, it's a syndicated program on the Michigan Talk Network, and I was asked to do it, uh, and I've done it for almost uh, yeah, a year and a half, and the podcast, uh, which is fun, and I never would have thought of the podcast except Dennis Denno, who was a local uh, former legislative aide and uh, pollster and uh, political consultant, asked me, hey, would you like to do a podcast? Uh, with me, and I said, well, I'm not even sure I know, I mean, I barely know what a podcast is, but <laughs> whatever. And of course, you know, obviously podcasts have become huge. You're listening to the Friday Morning Podcast with hosts Bill Ballinger and Dennis Denno, discussing Michigan politics and political history. The Friday Morning Podcast has you covered. Thank you, Jim Cotter, for that introduction. Bill Ballinger, the governor's got what she wanted. <laughs> she has budgets. The Michigan House, Michigan Senate earlier this week passed 16 departmental budgets. She can veto them. She can line item veto them. Um, what, do, what do you think about all this? She could sign them. She could, oh, she could also <laughs> sign them, of course. Uh, actually, I'm busy all the time. I'm still going around giving talks to groups. I, I'm going to do one tomorrow. Um, and I'm really doing pretty much the same thing I always did uh, with the Inside Michigan Politics newsletter. I just don't have to meet a deadline every two weeks for a four-page newsletter. And so I'm pretty pleased with where I am, but I can be doing a lot better and a lot more, and I intend to. Bill, you're also one of the very few people to have been both a guest and a panelist on the public television program Off the Record. How right. far back do you go with that show? You know, I was on it when I was a legislator. I remember that, uh, a state senator in the early 70s. I think the program started in 1972. Tim Skubik deserves an incredible amount of credit for what he's been able to pull off. Can you imagine 47 straight years, one week after the other, never missing a week? I'm not even 47. I know. I, know. <laughs> I mean, it's unbelievable. Ask your parents. Yeah, right. I mean, it's unbelievable. And there, it's the longest running state-based uh, televised political show in the entire country. There is no other state has anything like it. And I was on it when I was a state senator in the early 70s. I remember I was on it when Governor Milliken appointed me Director of Licensing and Regulation in March of 1977. I went on it that spring. I've got the transcript of it then. Uh, later, of course, uh, I became a member of the panel of journalists uh, on the program. Now, the four people that I can think of, out of thousands, Kyle, thousands of guests that Tim has had over 47 years. Think about it. He hasn't missed a week in 47 years. He's had a guest almost every week. Sometimes he skips. He's had thousands of guests. Only four have served on both sides of the table. George Weeks, Bob Berg, Matt McLogan, and me. Hmm. In other words, they were on it as guests, and they were on it as journalists. 
But only one of the four has gone in the direction I went, who started out as a public figure, an elected official, and went to be a journalist. The other three started out as journalists, Weeks, Berg, and McLogan, and became public officials. And so those are the four out of thousands. What side is more fun? <laughs> oh, I would say definitely journalists. Being, the, being a panelist is more being fun, I got to imagine, yes. Yeah, I mean, you're in the hot seat there. You just hope you don't screw up. Take some <laughs> courage to get on that program. Yeah. You can tell a lot of the guests are a little nervous when they get there and they make nervous jokes. Being on Off the Record, having the radio program, the podcast, you have the opportunity to do something that you are exceptional at, interviewing people. And I would like to think that your ability to interview also is able to translate into your years of teaching. You were also, you've taught at several universities and colleges. How would you equate interviewing individuals and trying to get information to and from your students? Yeah, honestly, I think the biggest challenge is trying to get information to students. Uh, really getting them really to care and to really understand what you're trying to impart. I was a visiting professor in an endowed chair at Central Michigan University between 2003 and 2007, and I had some very interesting students in the class. Some of them have gone on to serve as legislative aides in the legislature. One of them became a state representative. Andrea LaFontaine, Republican, was one of my students. Um, but you know what? It's really tough, unless you're a total political junkie. Um, a lot of students take these courses, and they're just not as engaged as I would think they w should be. And uh, I feel a little frustrated trying to connect with them. I also felt, you know, they had a little too much knowledge from the academic ivory tower about political science and not enough from the kind of information and knowledge that I held in high esteem that I've described earlier as what is really going on in politics at the grassroots. Why are people being elected? What are the issues? What's the difference in public opinion? How do people comport themselves once they're elected to the legislature? I didn't feel there was enough. So I kind of spent a lot of my time teaching, trying to make the students realize uh, how tough it was to get elected, what they had to do to get elected. And maybe that inspired somebody like Andrea Fontaine because she was a human cyclone as a candidate. Uh, I never would have guessed it uh, from the girl I knew in the classroom, but that is what she did. She outworked all her opponents. I, I think that was tougher than interviewing people on radio. I, I Guess what? I love to interview people on the radio. That is the easiest thing to do in the world. You just ask people questions. You get them talking and, and get them to tell a story. And you know what? All this hostile journalism, gotcha stuff, blindsiding people, and trying to embarrass people. Why? Why do that? There is so much stuff out there that should be coming from individuals that they should be glad to talk about, are eager to talk about. And anything I can do to get them to open up and I mean, I try and make everybody feel, for instance, in my syndicated radio show, just completely relaxed. I mean, we do a lot of laughing. Um, there's a lot of humor in politics, and more of that ought to come out uh, in interviews, and it just doesn't. Everything is so grim and dour and intense and threatening, uh, both at the national and state level. I, it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, Bill, you have two children, if I'm correct. Yes. Um, what piece of advice uh, are you most proud of as far as extending to them about their future or their lives in general? Boy, you know, that's a great question. I've got two very different children who are very close to each other personally, and yet they're really different. I've got a daughter who is uh, ideologically, I would say, she likes to think a, a moderate. Uh, she works for the federal government. She works for the Government Accountability Office, the GAO out of her home, 
uh, in Traverse City, even though the GAO is the auditing arm of Congress in Washington. She has to go down there once a month for about a week, uh, every month. Uh, her husband is the superintendent of Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore. Uh, I didn't give her any advice about that. Uh, uh, you know, he, he's a national park ranger. Uh, they met on their own in Washington, D.C. two decades ago. Um, I think she's like me in the sense she was on the Michigan Daily a newspaper. Uh, she liked journalism. That's what she does for the GAO right now. She is a writer, researcher, investigator for the GAO the auditing arm of Congress. Now, I never, you know, pushed her in that direction. I didn't know that's where she was going to end up. She worked as a journalist in South Africa for three years. She worked on an environmental newsletter in Washington for a couple of years before she got the job at the GAO. I would just say this, somehow, by osmosis, my interest in journalism and writing rubbed off on her. Okay, without me consciously trying to direct her or teach her. Now, my son, get this, he is a history teacher, chairman of the history department at the King's Academy in Amman, Jordan, the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. The King's Academy founded by the king. He went over there three years ago. And before that, 14 years, he was a history teacher at a private secondary school in Boca Raton, Florida called St. Andrews. He's a fanatic on the subject of history. He loves history. I love history. You know, that rubbed off. He's much better on history than his sister. Uh, she's a great writer, researcher, investigator, but she's not really that into history. He's a fanatic. Uh, but he also is involved doing other things that I never would have dreamed of, except one thing. I walked through Michigan, right? He's ended up as being, you know, this incredible bicyclist and hiker. He's hiked the entire Appalachian Trail. He's hiked the entire Pacific Rim Trail. He has pedaled coast to coast on a bike solo with everything on its back from Maine to Oregon and another time from Washington to Virginia. Okay? Now, would I have ever done that? No. But he might not have ever walked through Michigan either. But there's some similarity. There's something genetic going on there. I don't know what it is, but there's some connection between the two, and yet they're both doing completely separate and different things. You have such a busy schedule, even though you are at an age where a lot of people would consider, you know, it's, it's about time to retire. But you seem to have some wonderful balance in your life. What is it that keeps you balanced and maybe away from politics, away from writing? Do you have, have interests such as maybe sports or pets or hobbies? That kind well, of sports and pets, as you know well. Um, I'm a sports fan, big sports fan. Um, so I watch a lot of sports on TV. Uh, pets, uh, I really have always loved cats and dogs. I grew up with cats. Now we've got uh, a dog, and we had a great dog before that, a Norwegian Elkhounds, greatest breed in the history of canine world. Um, so uh, pets and sports, but in terms of getting me to stop and retire, I mean, what, I don't even know what retirement means. I mean, you know, I, you know, I'm doing what I really like to do, and I just think I've got you know, so much to offer still, I've got big enough ego to say in politics, I'm going to make people listen to what I say. And if they want to pay me for it or hire me to come in and talk to them, I'll do that. And I'm still doing it. I have a feeling that your idea of retirement would be like your retirement, quote unquote, from inside Michigan politics, an adjustment into something new, an adjustment into something different, an adjustment into a different use of your time and your schedule. I think that's absolutely right, yeah. I mean, I think there are different ways you can do things. I feel, for instance, like right now, with the podcast and the talk radio program, I'm actually doing something that's easier to do and more natural for me to do and actually maybe 
better for me to do than writing. I mean, I, I don't necessarily think I've ever really made of myself as a writer what I dreamed when I majored in English literature back at Princeton I could become. But when I talk on radio or on TV, I feel I can pretty much do it right or do it nearer to the standard that I aspire to. You are considered the expert pundit when it comes to Michigan history and Michigan government. Uh, do you view yourself as that, or, or is that just a label that I guess the rest of the political world has kind of dubbed you with? Well, I think what that, is a pundit? Well, a pundit is a really a predictor, um, you know, a commentator, an analyst. Uh, it's beyond simply being a, a reporter, a journalist, a scrivener, somebody who gives you the facts. Uh, you go to a pundit to ask his or her opinion in addition to uh, plumbing the depths of his or her knowledge. Um, I would say, uh, you know, I think the title has been uh, conferred upon me by others mainly because longevity. I've just been around so long and people look and they say everybody else is gone. They're either dead or retired, retired. or resigned. This, this uh, anomaly, this uh, uh, holdover from a bygone era, from the Paleolithic age, is still with us, walking the earth like a Tyrannosaurus Rex. And so we've got to view him uh, as something unique. But I will say, when you talk about a, a historical political pundit, you know, there are a lot of people here in the state who are fantastic historians. But how much about politics do they really know? And there are a lot of people who know a lot about politics in Michigan, but how much political history do they really know? I mean, I noticed, for instance, there's been a lot of talk recently about the state administrative board. And, you know, uh, the governor has said, look, this has been around for 98 years. And I thought, yeah, in 1921, Alexander J. Grosbeck founded it. He was the Republican governor, and guess what? It existed at that time, and nobody has pointed this out, of people who were almost entirely elected officials on their own, individual. We had a new constitution come in in 6061. Now most of the people, except for the Attorney General and Secretary of State, are appointed by the governor. Yeah, we used to elect our superintendent and our treasurer. Absolutely. Every one of those people, transportation, uh, you know, Auditor General, everybody, they were all elected. And they were elected independent of governor. You had many years in Michigan's past when you had totally split government. You'd have a governor of one party. You could have a lieutenant governor of a different party. We had a, a different lieutenant governor from the governor's party as recently as 1963-64. T. John Lisinski and George Romney, famous stories about them. That was the last time we had it. So, I mean, the point is when people make these comments like uh, 98 years, I'm not going to give this power up. Well, I, I wouldn't give it up either if I were the governor at this point. And I wonder if she really knows how far she has deviated in using that power now from what Grossbeck thought it was going to be used as in 1921 and as the officials elected at that time thought it would be. Hmm. That's interesting because yeah. now it's a tool of the governor, whereas Absolutely. back then it, it was not necessarily no, a tool no, of the governor. No, not necessarily and used for a completely different purpose. Hmm. How interesting. Um, I wanted to go back to something that you said a while ago about the 1982 walk around the state. I, yeah. I just really find this extremely <laughs> fascinating. Uh, what do you think you could have done differently in that race to have won? To actually have won, because what you did yeah. is so different than what you could possibly do today. But I'm curious if there was anything you could have done there to have actually won while still doing what you did. One word, money. Okay. Raise more money. Uh, when Lamar Alexander did this in Tennessee, Lawton Childs in Florida, uh, they were able to get off the hiking trail, the walking trail, and raise money. Uh, it was a little easier for Alexander, for instance. He was older than I was at the time. He had run for governor once. Uh, he was a lawyer. He'd worked for Howard Baker, the U.S. Senator. He had a lot of connections, so he was able to raise a lot of money. You've got to reinforce the message from the walk. You've got to remember, 
the people who knew about the walk were just reading about it in the newspaper from reporters. Uh, there were no ads. Uh, I had no ads. I mean, I ran the lowest budget U.S. Senate campaign. It's got to be in the last 40 years. I mean, I really only raised and spent about $50,000. $50,000. And you finished in second place. I finished in second place. Wow. And, and so, I mean, I, I, I basically had no money. I'll say one other thing I forgot to mention earlier that was really intriguing about the walk was the people who followed the walk cared about it so much that they would actually come up to me on the road, total strangers. The car would stop on a shoulder as I'm walking down the highway. I always walk facing traffic on the shoulder. And somebody would get out of the car and I thought, uh-oh. <laughs> but they would come up to me and they'd say, I'm Joe Blow from Howard City. And uh, nice to meet you. I'd say, oh, great. Great to meet you, Joe. He said, are you coming to Howard City? I'd say, well, uh, you know, I might I actually think I'll get through there, but it'll be another month or two. Well, will you just get a ring? Here, here's my card. Here's my number. <laughs> Give me a ring. and You can stay at my house. You can stay overnight. I'll put you up uh, when you get there. 44 times. I stayed in 44 different houses with total strangers. During the t on this walk, what an experience. going through the state. I mean, people were coming up. I, it was unbelievable. So, I mean, I had all sorts of experiences like that I'll never forget. And I can't go anywhere in Michigan nowadays driving without crossing some intersection and saying, oh, my God, I remember when I was there. I remember the walk, you know, in 1982. You remember it. You have so many vignettes, so many stories. Yeah. You've known so many people. So many interesting little sidebars. You just mentioned some about your hike. Can you just list some of the some of the wonderful people, stories, important people, not so some people who have just kind of formed the the fun of all of this, or maybe they've been extraordinarily. You mean overall in politics, the entire overall suite? in politics? Well, I mean, the, there, there the are certain yeah, there are certain people you remember. Uh, I mean, John Engler, uh, we've talked about previously. John Engler was only uh, you know like 21 years old when he was first elected, and he had me actually come up and speak to his Beale City uh, commencement, give the Beale City commencement address. <laughs> Uh, and, and go over to the Engler farm and have dinner afterwards. Uh, I still remember it back in, I think it was like 71, when I was a senator and he was a freshman state rep. Um, and then we had the district office together in Greenville for a year where he was the Maytag repairman. And, uh, you know, I obviously have always had a good relationship with John Engler during the years. I remember. Uh, him calling me up when he was governor uh, years after I was racing commissioner and saying, I'm thinking about making so-and-so my racing commissioner. And uh, the guy he was considering was uh, named Nelson Westron. He was my legal counsel. And I said, you know what, governor, that would be an inspired choice. <laughs> Appoint him. And he did. And Nelson Westron was a great racing commissioner. He's the late unfortunately, uh, Nelson Western now uh, since passed on, but he was great. So, I mean, I remember John Engler and his family. Uh, I went to his uh, wedding uh, in San Antonio uh, uh, when he married uh, Michelle uh, de Munburn. And um, other people, obviously, Milliken, I remember a lot. I remember a lot about George Romney. I went to George Romney's funeral. Does anybody know where George Romney is buried? You Canada. Know, no, he's buried in Brighton. Brighton. Why Brighton? Remember I mentioned Jerry Rowe? <clears throat> Lenore Romney, George's wife, came to Jerry Rowe and said, where should we bury George? <laughs> and Jerry Rowe said, well, you know, he presided over American Motors as president living in Bloomfield Hills. And then he spent, uh, you know, a great time in uh, Lansing as governor of the state. How about halfway in between? Brighton. And they picked out a cemetery in Brighton they had no connection with. And he was buried there. And I remember I was at the grave site and everybody had left. And Jerry Rowe and I watched his casket being lowered into the ground. We were the last two people there. 
when it was lowered into the ground. So, I mean, th there are things like that you remember. Uh, I still remember George Romney lying in state um, in the rotunda in the Capitol, and uh, it was an open casket, and he had this long hair that he'd let grow. He looked like some kind of Old Testament patriarch, a Mormon patriarch, which is really what he was. He was a Mormon. And, and so, I mean, there, there are incredible stories like that, uh, other figures, uh, major figures over time. Uh, some of the reporters, I remember some of the great old reporters, Bob Longstaff, Glenn Engel, Roger Lane, Hugh McDermott, uh, people think of as old time. He retired nearly 20 years ago. He was recent for me. He came to Michigan for the first time uh, when I was in Washington in the Ford administration, I'd already served all my time in elective office by the time he got here. So the reporters I knew were ancient, uh, you know, going way back in time. And, you know, obviously the news media has changed dramatically over time. It's downsized substantially. And I would say, Kyle, that your newsletter, uh, the Michigan Information Research Service, MERS and Gongwer, I mean, really, you are today, to me, what the old-time really great newspapers like the Free Press and News were when they were fully staffed in Lansing with, you know, a full-time bureau and, and so-called. Uh, you have the influence and, and the knowledge base and what you impart to people who read you is really what journalism was for 150 years before you came on the scene uh, in the last two decades. Well, I appreciate that, Bill. I appreciate that compliment. And why do you think that is? Why do you think that we have shied away as far as a country, away from covering state or even local government? What, what's happening? I think it's economics. I mean, look, it's, it's the Internet. Uh, it's social media. I mean, you can't have a successful financial uh, economic model as a newspaper, uh, which depended on advertising. Uh, why do, do people have to necessarily pay for anything they can get free online? And so uh, finding the economic model uh, for journalism uh, is, is what will save journalism. The real question is, can it be saved? Can that model ever really be saved? I mean, journalism is doing everything it can. Um, uh, for instance, like right now, if one of my motives is in the Ballinger Report to actually make some money on it, I'm going to have to I, I, you know, do some things that I have been considering for some time that I haven't done yet. Whether they will work or not, I don't know. Uh, but it's a constant struggle. And if you don't have the money to afford the staff, then uh, you have to downsize. And I think you've got the right model, uh, MERS and Gongwer. I mean, you get a high, you know, a fairly high-priced uh, commodity that people have to have. I mean, I, there was one bit of advice I got from a uh, Tennessee Journal publisher back in the 1980s, before I started Inside Michigan Politics. He said, if you're going to start this newsletter, never overestimate the number of people who are going to subscribe to it, but never underestimate those who feel they have to have it are willing to pay. Mm -hmm. Now that combination, if you think about it, that is a successful model. And that is, whether you put it in those words or not, what you have done at MERS and what Gongor has done. Mm -hmm. And no other uh, newspaper, uh, publication out there covering politics and government has been able to do that. I also wanted to ask about the, how politics has changed. Uh, we hear in 2019 about how this is the most divisive time in politics and considering the entire history yeah. of this country, it's just kind of hard to believe. It just kind of seems like hyperbole. But compare politics of today, 2019, to um, politics from back when you were involved in the 60s, 70s, 80s, yeah. 90s, the yeah. lots. Well, look, the biggest thing is obviously uh, money and term limits. Um, everybody talks about those two things. Because when I first ran for office in 1968, I got to tell you, you won't believe this, um, I was ashamed 
to be seen as raising too much money in the race. Yeah. Uh, I had seven opponents in a Republican primary in the summer of 1968. Seven opponents. It was the biggest Republican primary in the state. And I think more votes were cast in that primary in my district than all but uh, one other district in the state. And I remember I, you know, desperately wanted one or more of my opponents to outspend me. <laughs> Definitely. I mean, I did not want the stigma of being seen as buying the race, okay? Uh, and in fact, two of my opponents did outspend me. And I was really proud of that because I finished first in an eight-member primary uh, with 27% of the vote. So nearly three out of every four voters voted against me, but I still won easily because three guys tied for second at about 18% apiece, and another guy got like 12% and another et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, I mean, contrast that to today, Kyle. I mean, you read any story about somebody setting out to run for anything, and the first thing you see is how much money have they raised? And what is the financial report? I mean, there's so much that's happened. Uh, going back to the U.S. Supreme Court decision, Buckley versus Vallejo in 1976, campaign financing, uh, you know, decisions that have been made since then, uh, the rise of political action committees, independent expenditures, the Citizens United decision of the Supreme Court in 2010. I mean, spending is off the charts. Well, I mean, that is just, I'm, I'm not going to say ruin things, but it just totally changed the dynamics. And then the other thing is term limits. Everybody talks about it. And I'm not going to dump on term limits, okay? I, I'm not as down on term limits, although I always voted against it. I always said it was a terrible idea. And all these people who come around cringing and moaning now saying, oh my God, I voted for term limits and I made a mistake. I said, well, you dummy. I told you at the time. I said, what do you expect? And they said, well, you're right. How can we get rid of it? I said, guess what? You're probably not going to get rid of it. Okay? But the point is, it does cut off the possibility of legislators, and particularly legislators, getting to know each other. Uh, really spending time with each other, building up relationships. Uh, so I think that's really important. That, but I'm going to say one other thing, kind of contrary to what I just said. All this idea that I hear nowadays about, oh my God, back in the good old days, everybody got along. We reached across the aisle. We all went out and drank together afterwards. And, you know, everything was, you know, amicable and I mean whatever differences we had on the House and Senate floor we left them behind and we went off and we caroused together we were colleagues we were buddies that is BS okay that was not true that was not true there was more of it then yes uh, more camaraderie then but not that much more uh, than there is now. I think one of the things that's changed is people used to live in Lansing more mm -hmm. and not go home as much as they do now. Uh, and when people do stay here, they kind of room in these boys' dorms and, and for two nights or three nights and then they drive back home and so forth. Um, that is, you know, uh, a totally different dynamic uh, than it used to be. But the idea that everything was sweetness and light between Republicans and Democrats in the so-called good old days, that isn't true, Kyle. Uh, there was a lot of animosity. There was a lot of mean-spiritedness. There were a lot of dirty tricks. Uh, politics has not changed that much, and it will not ever change that much. You got anything else? No, I don't. I was <laughs> going to say on that note of political wisdom, um, are there any last questions? No, I think I'm good. Bill, we would like to thank you for your candor, for your memory, your history, for projecting all that you have, for your contributions to, in the last, what, 
half century and more to the state of Michigan and elsewhere. And thank you for this time with us. Well, I'd thank the two of you. I mean, this is the first time the Michigan Political History Society has ever had two interviewers. That's a first. Probably will never happen again. And Susan, congratulations to you. You are the first female interviewer ever in the history of MPHS. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Bill. Thanks for the time.